putting them in then. Yes, here. Okay, I'm going down this list of 10 people. So many of these names I recognize. Okay. Yes. I think that's everyone that was in the rating room. Okay, so we have 15 people here. Maybe we should at least wait till 7-7 seven, seven or something. There's two more. So that's now 18 people. We have a good turnout this evening, 701, and we're almost at 20. That's great. Terry Cheney is here. Do you remember her? Uh, Dr. Martyr, Terry Cheney? Yes, I do. Yeah, she wrote a book. She was right. in the entertainment industry, and she wrote a book. Right, about I do. Bipolar disorder. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and, the, and she was more respected after she told everybody in the right. entertainment industry than when she was in hiding. I don't know how to do this. Unmute me. Hi, Jen, we haven't started yet. Perhaps we'll start with a brief introduction and then when others, if they'd like to join us, they can join. Okay. Okay. okay well, uh, welcome everyone. It is May Mental Health Awareness Month. And thank you for joining our May Janice Black Warner Speaker Series. I'm Erin Raftery Ryan, the Executive Director of NAMI West Side, Los Angeles. Uh, I see many familiar faces, but for those of you who are new to NAMI, it is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization dedicated to improving the lives of those living with mental health conditions and their loved ones. We are the Westside Los Angeles affiliate. And to learn more about our free programs and services, you can visit our website, which is namiwla.org. I would like to thank Janice Black Warner, uh, our advisory council member and angel uh, for many years for making this event possible. I'm now excited to introduce our wonderful Mental Health Awareness Month May speaker, Dr. Stephen Martyr, MD. He is a professor. Hi, of Bob. Yeah. Wait, somebody is talking here. You know, uh, who is that that's talking? We have to mute ourselves right now while we're introducing the speaker. All right. Okay. So okay. please mute yourself, uh, Jan, uh, while we're introducing the speaker. Okay. Go ahead, Erin. Thank you, Sharon. Yes. Um. All right. So we. Uh, I'm. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Stephen Martyr, and he has a very esteemed career. Um, here are just some highlights. He is a professor of psychiatry at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA and the director of Mental Illness Research, Education and Clinical Center. He is also the director of Section Psychosis at UCLA. 
This evening, he will be speaking about new medications for psychotic disorders. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Marger. And before we welcome him, actually, um, our clinical mental health director, Sharon Dunis, will say a couple words about Stephen Martyr. Thank you. So Stephen, Stephen Martyr has been at UCLA for many, many years, and he's very beloved by so many patients. And he's also so respected by all of his colleagues there at UCLA. He holds a very esteemed position treating schizophrenia and other illnesses, but I think treating schizophrenia is the, the main, his main interest and focus. He has always provided speakers for NAMI Westside LA. Uh, throughout the years, he has works with many interns. He trains other young men and women to become psychiatrists. And he's always provided NAMI Westside LA with amazing speakers talking about the old meds and the new meds. And tonight we get a real treat because he's gonna bring uh, to your uh, knowledge base some of the newer antipsychotic meds. So it's such a treat to have you, Dr. Martyr. And uh, it, it's just a perfect setting for ment starting mental health months, which is May, to have you be our guest speaker. Mm -hmm. So I turn it over to you, Dr. Martyr. We're looking at his screen. He's going to show a PowerPoint for the first part of the speaker series. Then we're going, going to open it up for questions and answers to him personally. Okay, Dr. Martyr, I turn the meeting over to you. Sharon, th th thanks so much. And thanks for in inviting me to speak. It's, uh, you know, Sharon, you've... You've done such a wonderful uh, job at bringing together this wonderful community at uh, NAMI Westside. And I just feel like it's a privilege to uh, be able to speak here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. I, uh, I treat people with schizophrenia in a, in a clinic at UCLA. And I also do research uh, and a substantial amount of teaching. My career has focused on uh, how to improve the lives of people who have psychotic illnesses. Um, since I'm going to talk about drugs, uh, I, I just want to disclose that uh, for some of the drugs that I'm going to talk about, I've actually consulted to the companies. So uh, that's a conflict of interest. The only thing you should know that I've been a consultant for drug development. I don't do talks for drug companies. Uh, so I'm not the kind of person who gets paid to give a talk. Um, what, what I'm excited about, and I think this is going to be the trajectory of this talk, is that we're at a very interesting time in the history of drug treatment of schizophrenia, a time when uh, I believe that uh, within the next year or two, there will be new drugs that work very differently. And I'm going to go over this landmarks again a little bit later, but I wanted to give you a feeling about my optimism. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the drugs that are already available that, uh, you know, I'm, I think they're good contributions, but I'm not thrilled about them. Then I'm going to talk about the new antipsychotics. Uh, I'm calling non-D2. They, they don't work by dopamine. They work by an entirely different mechanism. So they won't have some of the problems that the current antipsychotics do. I'm going to talk about medications that can be added to an antipsychotic when patients have uh, cognitive problems and a lack of motivation to help them engage more in the community. I'm also going to talk about the, some of the new medications for tardive dyskinesia. And finally, I, uh, one of the major problems in, with people with psychotic illnesses is just the high prevalence of diabetes and obesity and, uh, and you know, heart disease. 
And uh, right now, uh, there's been a revolution in the treatment of diabetes and obesity with exciting new medications. And I think it's going to be very important that our that we and our family members who have uh, serious mental illnesses uh, get access to these drugs. So I'll, I'll talk about that for a while. So the newest antipsychotic on the uh, market is lumetepirone or Caplida. It's, uh, it's not, its mechanism is the same as all of the older antipsychotics. Uh, I'm calling it a D2 agonist, a, a, a dopamine antagonist. Uh, it probably has less extrapyramidal side effects, things like uh, stiffness and restlessness. Uh, and it may actually work a little bit differently. I'm not totally convinced that that's the case. Um, this, uh, when it's been, the studies show that it's effective. Uh, it's an effective antipsychotic. What we don't know is if it's more effective than other antipsychotics or if it's uh, particularly effective for people with, uh, who don't respond to other drugs. Uh, it, what we do know is it has uh, a, a reasonably good side effect profile. It uh, doesn't cause substantial weight gain. The usual dose, if you look at the top left, is 42 milligrams, and you could see the weight gain is, rel is, is minimal, uh, and it just kind of overlaps with uh, placebo, which is a control. It doesn't elevate uh, prolactin, which is a good thing. So it doesn't cause the kind of uh, sexual disturbances and uh, other kinds of disturbances from elevated prolactin. And uh, extrapyramidal side effects are, are fairly mild. Um, you know, just today, I, I saw a patient who said that uh, they were getting uh, lumetepirone keplida and that it, it worked better for them than other drugs. So, you know, there's some reason to be optimistic. Uh, it has some side effects, uh, but I haven't seen them be very prominent. Here it has seda sedation, nausea, and dry mouth. And as I've said, it causes relatively little other side effects. Um, there's only one study that compared it to other antipsychotics, and it seemed to be similar to risperidone. Um, the other new drug is a combination drug. It's, uh, as you may know, many of you have taken olanzapine. It's a very effective antipsychotic, but it's got a, um, it just caused severe weight gain and uh, diabetes and, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and increases risk factors for, for heart disease. Uh, this is a drug which combines olanzapine with samidorphan, which is a drug which attenuates appetite and attenuates the weight gain. So if you look at this, the orange uh, line is weight gain from olanzapine, and the green line is the, uh, this combination, olanzapine samidorphan. So what you see is, uh, Olanzapine samidorphan doesn't cause weight loss. What it does, it decreases the amount of weight gain. Uh, and again, weight gain from olanzapine can be just as the terribly severe problem. Uh, this is a, a shows you over the course of a year that uh, uh, if you look at the beginning in the in the first months, that's the initial weight gain. And then weight tends to stable, stabilize. So it does seem like this drug, this combination drug, does make uh, olanzapine a bit safer. What we don't know is whether or not uh, if somebody's on olanzapine and they change to the combination, are they going to be able to, to lose weight? Uh, We've had a couple of people who have done that in our clinic, and I'm still not 
confident that it actually does that. Uh, pay, it shouldn't, uh, you know, it shouldn't be prescribed in people who are taking some kind of an opiate for pain or some other reason, uh, or if they're in opiate withdrawal. Um, and it's not clear because the other thing that olanzapine does is it elevates uh, blood sugar, blood glucose, and it elevates lipids, which you know are a, a risk factor for heart disease. And it's unclear if uh, from the study that that, that olanzapine really uh, prevents that from happening. That olanzapine samodorfan prevents that from happening when compared to olanzapine alone. Okay, so now, so so those are the two new drugs which are good but not thrilling. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about what it excites me. And uh, so these are what I consider to be the landmarks in uh, uh, pharmacological treatment. Uh, the uh, chlorpromazine or Thorazine was the first antipsychotic. It was discovered in 1954. It uh, reached the, you know, the Western hemisphere just a couple of years later. And the effects were dramatic. It was the first effective antipsychotic. Many patients could uh, leave the hospital and live in the community. And uh, it was a, um, a major contribution to improving the lives of people with schizophrenia. Between then and 1990, just dozens of antipsychotics were introduced. They were slightly different, but none of them were more effective than fluoropromazine. Uh, they had better side effect profiles. Um, clozapine was uh, introduced uh, in 1990. Uh, in 1988, the major study came out with uh, clozapine, and uh, I actually wrote the editorial that accompanied that article. And I believe I was the first person to prescribe uh, clozapine uh, in our area. It was, uh, I, it was before it was approved. I got, uh, was able to get what was called uh, from the FDA, a humanitarian use IND. So I was able to prescribe it to people. And uh, the first patient, was going from a uh, IMD to a state hospital back and forth, floridly psychotic. She received clozapine and it changed her life. Within, uh, within a month, she was symptom free. She was living in an apartment and just a couple of months later, she graduated from UCLA, got a master's, has been a functioning person and just retired and I still manage her clozapine. And when we meet, it's just both of us are so grateful to each other, uh, her for you know finding the right treatment and me for regaining an optimism that uh, with the right kinds of treatment, we can really change the course uh, of an illness. Uh, you know, restored my confidence in treatment. So I'm going to show you that there are two new drugs that are going to come out very soon. And I don't know whether or not they're going to be a landmark like clozapine, but I, you know, you can judge for yourself from my presentation whether or not uh, my, you know, optimism is justified. Uh, so the first one is, is a drug which I'm going to call uh, a muscarinic agent. Muscarinic agents, they don't work on dopamine. They work on a different neurotransmitter, uh, acetylcholine. I done and I'll call them uh, cholinergic drugs or do? muscarinic drugs. And uh, way back in the 1950s, there were suggestions that these drugs might work for people with psychotic illnesses. Uh, it was found in uh, 2000, there was a publication that betel nuts, which are high in arecoline, which is cholinergic, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia actually decreased the severity of positive and negative symptoms in schizophrenia. In 1997, uh, Lilly was uh, developing a drug called Xenomaline. Uh, 
to improve cognition. Uh, the, uh, some of the drugs that are currently used to um, improve cognition in people with Alzheimer's disease are cholinergic drugs and xenomaline uh, acts by a, a different me mechanism. And it was studied in people with Alzheimer's. Uh, and it was noted that those people who had a psychosis with, uh, when they were treated with xenomaline, their cognition improved a bit, but their psychosis improved substantially. So that led to a study that was uh, done in uh, 2008, uh, where uh, in people with acute schizophrenia, they were treated with placebo or xenomaline, which is the blue lines. And you could see that uh, xenomaline was very effective. But, and, and this is the key, but if you look at uh, this table of side effects, this was a small study. There were 10 patients in each group. Seven out of 10 patients were nauseated. Six out of 10 patients vomited. vomited uh, and seven out of patients had uh, gastrointestinal distress. In other words, it was a drug that approved psychosis and made people feel miserable. Obviously not something that's going to be marketed. And some of us followed this over the years, and we, we consulted with Lilly and the NIMH about whether or not it, there was a way to rescue this drug, which has no effect on dopamine, but improves psychosis. And uh, what eventually happened was the idea came about that they would combine xenomaline with another drug which would antagonize its peripheral effects so that the normaline could have the effects on the brain that we want, but it wouldn't have the effect on uh, the digestive system that would make people nauseated and vomit. So this is a drug called, uh, uh, here it's called, it's called the cholinergic receptor agonist. Uh, it uh, actually has a name, uh, Eulodorant. But this was a study from the New England Journal of Medicine from a few years ago, which is the most prestigious uh, psychiatric journal. And you could see on the upper left, when compared to a placebo, it had uh, it was a highly effective antipsychotic. It was also very effective against negative symptoms. If you look at, at panel D, the negative symptoms, uh, it's uh, very effective. And if you look at this, the advantage, this was a five-week study, but if you look, the advantage of xenomaline trospium is actually increasing over time. And uh, if you look at E, which is a, called the PANS martyr factors, which I developed, you could see similarly that it, it improves negative symptoms. So it's highly effective. And many of us were very excited about uh, the potential of this drug. Uh, fortunately, other studies have shown that, uh, have reinforced its effectiveness. This is what's called, for a drug to be approved by the FDA and to get to market, it needs to go through different phases of research. And uh, the critical phase is the phase three trial, which is larger. And this is the phase three trial which hasn't been published, but it's, uh, I've looked at the data and uh, it it's, looks very effective. It's a five week uh, study in adults. Uh, and again, you could see the, uh, here it's called, it's got a name, it's called CAR-XT and it's very effective. Uh, it's uh, more effective than placebo over five weeks. This is positive symptoms, things like hallucinations and delusions. Uh, and this is negative symptoms where you could see again that people are continuing to get better at four and five weeks, suggesting that these trials aren't really revealing the potential of the drug. Um, and, and this just looks at response rates. 30% is a substantial improvement. And uh, 
you could see more than half of patients had it at five weeks. Now, remember I told you that it caused uh, nausea or vomiting in about uh, 60 or 70% of people. Here in the, uh, this study at five weeks, it caused uh, nausea in about 19% and vomiting in 14%. So it's still a problem. On the other hand, it's, uh, according to people who prescribe the drug, people tend to get used to it and the side effect kind of diminishes over time. But this will be you know, a concern when uh, this drug, car, car XT, gets to market. I usually don't show um, news releases from drug companies in my talks, but th this one came out just a, a few weeks ago on March 20th, that they had another phase three trial and that uh, the, um, they expect the drug to be launched sometime in 2024. The, they're anticipating FDA approval uh, sometime very uh, in late this year or early next year. So this drug uh, very well will be on the market. There are so many things we don't know about it. Uh, and uh, we, we do know it's effective. We know that it works by an entirely different mechanism from any other antipsychotic that's ever been marketed. Uh, and uh, hopefully many, many of the patients who don't do well and, and have an incomplete response to the old D2 drugs uh, will um, do well on this. And uh, maybe it'll be better tolerated than clozapine. Clozapine is the most effective antipsychotic. It's changed lives, but also it causes things like weight gain and other side effects. And those don't seem to be problems with uh, CAR-XT. Um, so now I'm gonna go to the second kind of drug. And uh, this is another entirely new mechanism and uh, one that I think will lead to a, a drug relatively soon. Um, these are uh, chemical messengers uh, that we haven't looked at before for studying antipsychotics. Uh, they're called tracemine associated receptors and uh, studies in um, rats, uh, have shown that uh, these drugs uh, get to the right brain area and that they seem to act like antipsychotics and that uh, they may have even a broad effectiveness because antipsychotics don't really oppose drugs like PCP and ketamine, but uh, these TAR1 agonists uh, do. And, um, well, I'll, I'll skip this. It just shows the chemical, uh, that these are similar to drugs like dopamine, but they're very sm a much smaller uh, concentration. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so th this is from the first study uh, of, uh, of, of this drug, which here it's called a, uh, it just has a number but uh, now it has a name called uh, Eulodoron. And you could see like CAR-XT, it's very effective over four weeks for acute schizophrenia. The green line is uh, Eulodoron and it's compared to a placebo, seems to be very effective. And uh, it was effective for uh, negative symptoms. And, uh, and these are just two scales that are used to measure negative symptoms. As you may know, uh, negative symptoms, the kind of lack of dry, the lack of social interest, the lack of uh, the sort of lack of energy that people will put out for rewards is one of the most uh, difficult symptoms in uh, psychotic illnesses to manage. So a drug that helps with negative symptoms would be a uh, would be really a wonderful thing. Um, now, what about the side effects of this drug? Uh, this looks at uh, if you look on, on the left at uh, 
drowsiness, at somnolence or drowsiness, agitation, nausea, it's virtually the same as placebo. If you look at weight gain, it's uh, not there. If you look at all the measures that we worry about with uh, cholesterol and lipids and blood sugar and prolactin, it doesn't affect those at all. Um, and, and, and this is, uh, if you take that first four weeks of the study, that's kind of in the left. And then all of the patients were put on uh, Eulodorant and they stayed on it here for 26 weeks. And you could see that they continue to improve over, over that time. So it, it's a drug that's whatever effects it has, it, it, it seems, they, they seem to last. And now if you look at its side effect profile, you know, it, it, it almost, it always seemed to me that if a drug was really effective, it had to have bad side effects. But something about this drug, is, it's almost creepy. It just doesn't seem to have any side effects. Uh, if you look at uh, it, people don't gain weight on it. It doesn't increase uh, blood sugar or cholesterol. Prolactin goes down a little bit. Uh, people, you know, you know, you know, the rates of uh, insomnia and nausea uh, are probably very similar to the population, uh, you know, you know, within people like schizophrenia. So uh, the phase three trial will be completed within the next few months. And if it's positive, and it would be surprising if it's not positive, given the strong uh, data that we already have, Again, I think it'll be on the market relatively soon. And uh, so, so that's what makes me optimistic about uh, uh, treatments. Now I wanna move. So those are two drugs that are antipsychotics. They could be prescribed alone without anything else. Uh, and um, they'll be effective. Now I'm gonna talk about the issue of co-medications. So these are medications that you would add if someone's on an antipsychotic and say they have cognitive impairment, they have problems with memory and attention and things like that. Um, uh, or if they have negative symptoms, things like uh, a lack of drive, a lack of social interest, uh, you would add it to uh, to auto, in order to improve those symptoms. Um, and, 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 and this is a, a, the way our research group over at UCLA works. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to do what's on the right, which is to help people uh, improve their lives, to have better functional outcomes, to have better connections with their families, and uh, maybe even to, to work and engage in productive activities. And it seems that in order to get people with schizophrenia and other psychotic illnesses to sort of improve their functioning, uh, the antipsychotic drug doesn't uh, do that, but it's other things. It's uh, improving their cognition, uh, you know, memory, attention, uh, be able, being able to make decisions social cognition, which is the ability to kind of uh, pick up social signals, to feel empathy, to be able to sort of understand what other people are saying and to, uh, you know, to be able to interpret some of the social signals that many people with psychotic illnesses have trouble with, uh, that is very much associated with functioning. And of course, motivation, what I talked about as negative symptoms, the sort of interest in things that will help you function better. Uh, and so we're looking for drugs that can affect that. And a number of drugs have been studied. Uh, this is uh, data from Pimavanserin for negative symptoms. It's a, uh, it's a drug which is used for Parkinsonism uh, when people have psychosis. And it's, um, this is from a study of negative symptoms, and you could see it uh, improved negative symptoms 
and again, this is being added to an antipsychotic, uh, they're engaged in another study and we're waiting for the results. Uh, when I look at this slide, I see it has a small advantage. I wonder whether or not that, how, how important that advantage would be, but anything that helps negative symptoms is important. This is from a, a drug that's in development called Iclopertin. It's a, uh, it's a drug which is being studied for cognition, but it may be effective for, um, uh, for negative symptoms as well. And, and if you look at the higher doses to the right, you could see that after six and 12 weeks of treatment, adding it to an antipsychotic, patients improve. Um, that they showed more improvement. This, uh, this just shows it another way that with higher doses, they got um, uh, substantially more improvement uh, in cognition. Um, as you may know, many people with psychotic illnesses uh, want to get back to work or they want to get back to school, but they're limited by uh, the kinds of problems in memory and attention that uh, are, are really so hard to treat. Uh, so the, having this kind of drug would, would be very helpful. Okay, a, a brief commercial for my uh, research group. Uh, I, I, I don't think I need to apologize, but uh, we, we are doing studies with uh, this particular drug. And uh, if uh, any of you are interested, you could write down that phone number and, uh, and call us, uh, it's, uh, the study is limited to people under 50 uh, for some reason. And, uh, but if you have a, a relative or somebody who might qualify, and we have other studies for other populations with drugs that are very interesting. So uh, this is my brief advertisement. Um, there are other drugs that are in development. Uh, that are interesting. Um, you know, another one that operates through TAR, which I talked about with um, uh, Eulodorant. There are a couple of other drugs that, that I've named there. And uh, hopefully these drugs will also get it into development, uh, but they're not nearly as far along as CAR-XT and uh, Iclopertin, Eulodorant, Eulodorant. Um, as many of you know, uh, there are effective medications for tardive dyskinesia that have been around for a while. And uh, these are the two drugs, valbenazine and dutetrabenazine. Uh, we've studied these drugs. We prescribe them in our clinic uh, for patients who have the kind of mouth movements and sort of odd movements that people get after years of being on um, antipsychotics, uh, these drugs are relatively effective. This shows the reduction aims, which is the way we measure part of dyskinesia on uh, valbenazine. And uh, you could see at both 40 and 80 milligrams a day, it's very effective. This is the other one, dutetrabenazine. Uh, and you could see at the higher doses, it's very effective. My uh, experience with this drug, with both of these drugs, is that they are effective. That uh, almost everyone who goes on them uh, tolerates them. There are a few people who don't. They don't like the sedation and other side effects, uh, but uh, they do improve tardive dyskinesia if that's something that bothers uh, the patient. So I, I think they're important. I want to talk uh, in the last six or seven minutes about weight loss and diabetes, because in, in my clinic uh, where we treat schizophrenia, we also are uh, very focused on uh, the, the, the physical health of our patients. Uh, and when they gain weight and they develop type two diabetes, we consider this a problem which can shorten their lives. Um, it's interesting, this is from a study from Denmark, that people who uh, never had an antipsychotic 
are still with schizophrenia are three times more likely to develop uh, type two diabetes than people without schizophrenia, probably because they um, share genes uh, between the two illnesses. And then when we put them on a um, antipsychotic, it substantially increases their risk of developing diabetes and uh, gaining substantial weight. And this has the potential for shortening their lives, which is a, a very serious problem. Um, so why did the drugs do that? Uh, this is just, I don't think you have to pay attention to it, but we, we've learned a lot about how appetite is regulated uh, during the past 10 years. But this is done by uh, both the neuropeptides, which are these molecules that uh, are secreted both in the brain and in the gut, in the digestive system, that uh, regulate appetite. And some of them uh, actually um, are targets for uh, drug treatment. And the one that I'm going to point to is called glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1. And uh, this has been uh, targeting this peptide. Uh, it has been uh, caused one of the most revolutionary, well, a revolution in drug treatment of diabetes. Uh, now, people who gain weight from uh, an antipsychotic will tell you and this has been demonstrated in studies that usually they, uh, within the first eight to 10 weeks, they gain substantial weight. And then it's sometimes levels off, sometimes it doesn't. But what, uh, what they'll tell you is that uh, the drug seems to uh, decrease their satiety signal, the uh, signal that tells you that you've had enough to eat. So people who um, never had a weight problem before are suddenly, uh, they're not getting that signal to, that gets them to stop eating and they just keep on eating. And so what we wanna do is to get a, to give them a drug that kind of reinforces uh, something that'll stop them from eating. And this is why GLP-1 uh, uh, and GLP-1 agonists are the, the drug of our era. I mean, if you, uh, you know, I think if you were probably watching the Academy Awards, I imagine a substantial number of those people were taking Ozempic uh, to control. It's really uh, percolated all through. Uh, and, and there's another drug that, that's even more revolutionary that's just coming out. Uh, stemaglutide, Ozempic, is probably the most common. You've probably seen it advertised on television. You uh, give us, uh, people get a little kit and they inject it uh, subcutaneously uh, once a week. Uh, liraglutide or Victoza, uh, you have to inject it daily. And then Rebelsis, uh, which is also semaglutide, uh, you take it by mouth, but uh, People aren't sure that it's as effective. Some of these drugs are, uh, all these drugs are indicated for diabetes. Uh, some of them are indicated for uh, obesity. I know that uh, semaglutide has both indications. And I think more of these drugs, my concern is that when a new exciting treatment comes out, I don't want our patients and our family members to be the last to get access to those drugs. Uh, and I'm very worried that, um, you know, that uh, our patients aren't getting the kind of prim primary care doctors who are uh, prescribing them. In my clinic, we have an advanced practice nurse who sees the patients, and we're starting to prescribe these drugs. And, and, and we're finding, in some cases, rather remarkable results. Uh, this is only effective for people who want to lose weight, because if you're not motivated to eat less, uh, 
it's, it's not going to help. But again, it makes it much easier to reduce your food intake. Uh, and this is just from a, a study with uh, loroglutide. Uh, in, uh, uh, at 16 weeks, uh, people with uh, on loroglutide uh, lost 4.7 uh, kilograms. So that that probably like more than uh, you know you know more than eight or ten pounds, a, a substantial amount of weight. And we're hearing about patients losing 16 pounds and much more, whereas patients with placebo, and they all had aggressive treatment for uh, you know lifestyle interventions, which are also very effective. Uh, so I just wanted to mention those in this list of new drugs that I hope our patients have access to. So that's my last slide. I'll just leave with this one, which is you know sort of my, uh, I hope it's not naive optimism that we're at a, uh, an exciting time where maybe many of our family members and, uh, and patients out there will have uh, better treatments uh, for their illness. Uh, Sharon, I'll stop now and take any questions. I think you're still muted. Yes, okay. so if any of you have any questions for Dr. Martyr, just raise your hand. There's a little hand down there in reactions. Put that up and I will call on you and you can ask your question. And I will only repeat the question if I think Dr. Martyr didn't hear it. Mm -hmm. And so we have time here for questions from you and answers from Dr. Martyr. So if any of you have questions right now, I I have a question, but uh, let me hear, mm -hmm. hear from you first. Any of you have questions? Okay, yes, Evelyn. Evelyn, I think you may, are you muted? I think you may be muted. We can't okay, I yeah. unmuted myself finally. Yes. <laughs> yes, my question is regarding, are there any, is anything coming in the future that is like clozapine without having to do all the blood work every month? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, you know, un, 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 unless these two new drugs, which, you know, you know, people have made the case that uh, some of clozapine's advantage may be because it has similar activity, that it has this muscarinic activity. So it could be that um, uh, CAR-XT, which won't require blood uh, tests, will be, um, will have clozapine's effect without requiring blood tests, but but we don't know yet, uh, and it hasn't been, you know, it's the 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 company is trying to bring it to market. I think the drug uh, the tests comparing it to clozapine and seeing if it's effective in patients who don't respond to other antipsychotics. I, I think they're going to happen hopefully relatively soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're muted, Sharon. <laughs> My question is, do the side effects of these drugs usually abate over time, six months or a year for, mo for most of these drugs? You know, here, um, I'm, I'm relying on, on what people from the drug company are telling me in advisory boards. So, I, uh, so I've, I've, I'm not talking like an expert. And I, uh, I don't totally trust drug companies. I don't know. Uh, but uh, what, what they tell me is that people do, uh, that the dropout rates for both drugs, are very, uh, particularly for CAR-XT, are very low. So that the side effects seem to occur during the first weeks of treatment. I'm talking about the GI effects, the nausea and vomiting, and that they diminish. Again, again, I'm longing to prescribe these drugs and, uh, and, 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 and to see what happens. And I think we'll know more, you know, hopefully a little over a year from now when we're able to access them. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Martyr. Thank you. Uh, Colette, you have a question? Unmute yourself. I see yes. you're muted. Yes. Thank you very much. 
I'm trying to distill my question. Maybe I could just give you a little brief. Uh, I have a son. I have a son. Um, most recently, so he was on uh, Depakote Abilify and Seroquel, and uh, we wanted an injectable for him. He's been through a lot, um, and he's in a very good treatment center, and they put him on Invega. Mm -hmm. And after I saw my son like I'd never seen him, like memory, helping my husband with the ping pong table, he remembered being taught when he was young, humor, just it was, I was so exciting. And what happened is a couple, maybe two and a half weeks later, um, he was at a meeting at the treatment center and he said the crosstalk got so intense, he left the room and he thought it was a five foot fence and, and the other side was deeper, he broke his foot. He couldn't mm. bear the room, the voices. And mm. that, the day before, he would, that same day, earlier in the day, the therapist said he said he was doing well. So this was a great concern, like that, that idea that he, they can seem good and then this happens. And the, one of the explanations I received was that his metabolism, because he's all new, right? So I don't know if you could address that perhaps the metabolism, he metabolized the drug quicker than they thought because he had just started it. I don't know if you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it's, so this is, he. how many Invega injections had he, that he received? You know, they did like a baseline, they tapered him off. And then uh, I wish I could tell you, there's, you know, I'm not, I can't yeah. tell you. Uh, the, the thing about the long acting injectable drugs is it takes very long before people reach a stable steady state where, 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 where they have a steady level. So I think it's wonderful that he seems to be responding. I, uh, it might be that uh, his uh, early on that the drug is kind of stabilizing and then by the time he's getting a month or two, it, it's starting to, to go down. If he continues to get the drug, it'll probably stabilize. And uh, he won't have those periods where his blood level of the drug is, is relatively low. I don't think it's metabolism. I think it's that it's just taking time for the drug to stabilize. I, I hope that's the case. Can I throw one more thing? Because I was so glad what you said about clock. They're, they're gonna add, I wish I had specifics, which I haven't gotten from the doctor yet, but I believe they're adding Clozeril or going to replace it. Can you comment? I love what you said about clozapine, which I believe is clozaril, same thing. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Well, you know, you know, for one thing, you would like like to, you know, usually clozapine isn't added. It's, it may be part of a cross titration. You know, if your son is better than ever on the shots, uh, you know, I would give it a, a few months before deciding. But if he still has symptoms that bother him, uh, clozapine is the most effective drug. I mean, it's not even close. It's just, uh, it's got a side effect burden that other antipsychotics don't have. Uh, would you so, ever describe, do you think it's possible they would keep him on Vega and clozapine? Is that something people do or not? Uh, yeah, but it, I'm, I'm not sure it makes sense. Okay. Uh, I, I, you, know, you know, it's sometimes people on clozapine do better with a, another antipsychotic, uh, uh, and it's usually at a low dose. And, and uh, I would tend to use something like aracyprazole Abilify, which is also available as a long-acting drug. But I, I would, would sort of, you know, uh, I, the thing about Invega, it causes, uh, it also causes a lot of weight gain. And uh, when you add it to the clozapine, it's, it, it, it'll, I'm not sure it's the best combination. But again, you know, your clinician knows your son better than I do, of course. I think he might be tapering up. I wish I had more details, but I just wanted to sure. get you. It's been a great, great night. Thank you. So informative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, may, maybe I can. I don't see. Um, so, so let me go. Uh, Karen, Karen Cohen, maybe you have a question. If you could unmute. Yeah, yeah. you're unmuted. Um, yeah. My daughter has bipolar disorder mm -hmm. and has had about a hundred pounds of weight gain. Um, and I was, and she's a Kaiser patient. And I don't know if you know about this, but I, I'm just wondering how readily available are, and she has type two diabetes that's getting worse. And I'm just wondering 
if you know about the availability of like Olympic and the drugs in that category, such that she would be able to access them? I, I, I'm confident that at Kaiser, they should be able to uh, prescribe one of these drugs. Okay. I mean, if, if they don't, I would, uh, you know, they may want to try metformin first, uh, which is also useful for people who have weight gain and diabetes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, would, uh, I, I would advocate for your son if they're not interested in giving him one of these uh, new GLP-1 agonists. Uh, because that's that's becoming the standard of care, and I, I want our patients to receive it. Hey, thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Okay. Um, Joanne, I, I see you, you have a question. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask um, for the new drug, uh, Eulateron, that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. There was another drug you'd mentioned earlier that you had said that if you if someone had gained a lot of weight and they had started that drug, unfortunately, they probably wouldn't lose weight. If someone was on a different antipsychotic, say Vralar, mm -hmm. has gained a bunch of weight, is type 2 diabetic, if they switch to a different antipsychotic, are they likely to lose weight? If this particular one, you said it does not cause weight gain, or does it just, if they only start with that in the beginning, yeah. they won't gain the weight? If somebody gains the the drugs that are most likely to cause weight gain are um, uh, olanzapine, Seroquel, uh, and uh, clozapine, and mm -hmm. and the other drugs have it. And sometimes when you change people from one of those drugs to a drug that causes less weight gain, people will lose weight. Uh, okay. but but. I, just as somebody who's done it all the time, it's, I, I, I think it's a serious problem. And, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, I think changing it to psychotic is one thing, but I would do other things as well. You know, mm -hmm. uh, involve the person in some kind of lifestyle change with uh, exercise and diet change. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work as soon as possible, uh, get them on metformin or one of these new drugs because mm -hmm. I really think this is a uh, a serious problem and we have tools that we didn't have before that we didn't have just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I will. I will add for if anyone's interested to support what you had said before that the they have to want to lose weight because yeah. um, this person is is on metformin has been for many years and is also now on trulicity and. Mm -hmm. I think he's gaining weight. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, you know, it's, it's like you can go the opposite way too. It's really is up to them if they want to. Right. I wish there was something that could trigger the brain, you know, but it's not happening at this time. Yeah. But thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're muted, Sharon. Yeah. Hi, I, I, Tiffany, your question. And then Debbie. Yeah, I think Dick was before me. I didn't see Dick's hand up. Yep, Dick's hand is up. It is. And I'll, I'll go after Dick. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay Dick, your, your Thank question. You. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm curious. So <clears throat> for people that have been on like elazapine or clozapine long-term, 10, five to 10 years, and have already had serious weight gain from that, and basically metformin has been on board, but not effective. Mm -hmm. Could it be effective to start them on these newer diabetes medications that you're talking about? Or is it already too late because it's... Uh... It's not too late. It's never too late. It's, uh, you know, uh, I, I, as I think Joanne was saying, the person has to be motivated to eat less. Uh, uh, the, the drug makes it, it sort of activates the satiety signal and makes it easier to eat less. Uh, but the person has to want to do that. And, um, you, know, yeah, you know, no, no, it's not too late to add those drugs. And, you know, I don't know if you want to <clears throat> take this on now when you have other hands raised, but <clears throat> how do you help your patients navigate all these new exciting medications 
and being able to be sure that you're on the right one that has the maximum um, effects when once it takes a while to get the medications on board and at a, an effective therapeutic level, um, you know, that's a while. And then, you know, how do you at that point decide, did we pick the right one or do we need to look at another one? Or how do you help patients navigate that, that minefield, if you will? You know, I, I really think that we have to um, share these decisions with uh, uh, patients and, and family members and to talk about the uh, advantages of one versus the other. We also have to battle with insurance companies and payers to get people on the right drug. So, you know, you know I'm, uh, I'm very worried that, uh, that these new drugs are going to come out and it's going to be, uh, you know, getting insurers to pay for them is going to be a major barrier and that many of our patients who are most needy are going to be the last to get access. So there, there are all of these problems, but it's a, uh, it's, it's an interesting dilemma. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Tiffany, are you still here with your question? Yes, I am still here. Thank you. Yes, I'm, so let's go um, ahead with your question. I'm very happy to meet you, Dr. Martyr. I heard wonderful things about you from Cynthia Sirota. Oh, I should be right. I have Medi-Cal. Um, my son has been on and off of Invega for since 2017, but recently he's been consistently on it for two years. Mm -hmm. He still has delusions. He doesn't speak. He doesn't call me mom. He has very strange little things around his room that are all very symbolic to him, apparently. Yeah. He's not able to hold a job. He <sighs> doesn't interact with family. And he's also on Zyprexa and 300 of lithium and then um, benztropine for the shaking. And... My new doctor with, with him is seems a lot better than the old doctor, but still, of course, there's limitations. So the reason he's on the injection is because he cheeks his meds. So yeah. if clozapine was not was injectable, I would love to get him on clozapine. But and also he's very delusional about having his blood drawn. He, he gets really paranoid about people taking his blood. So yeah. I, I, I wish I could find a drug that he could take by injection that would solve the problem. It's, uh, you know, again, I, um, I think the, um, you know, well, you know, if there was any way for him to take ownership of his illness, exactly, and, and uh, so that it's not your problem and the doctor's problem but it's exactly. his problem and, yeah. he, and if he could find if he could look uh, at treatment as not a uh, something that other people want him to do right. but as a way for him to have a richer life and then maybe uh, yeah you hit the nail on the head that's exactly yeah. what it is I give him his meds yeah. I talk to the doctor. He will not talk to the doctor. The only said thing he says to the doctor is reduce my meds, period, mm -hmm. and no discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I hope sometimes things turn around. Yeah. yeah. Thank I you, Dr. So. Martyr. Thank you. Uh, Debbie, your hand's been up here. Debbie. Hi, Dr. Martyr. So my son uh, is 22 and he has type 1 diabetes. Oh. Uh, he has can type 1 diabetes. I'm sorry. Can we see you, Debbie? Uh, sure. Hold on. OK. Hi. OK, so my son has had type 1 diabetes since he was 13. Um, he refuses to acknowledge that he's ill. He, uh, he refuses medication. Um, 
if he were to go, and I was wondering also why Matt Foreman wasn't on the list in your last slide, um, since we were just discussing it. Well, I, I didn't put on the list because I wanted to put what's new. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I've, 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 I was really focused on what's new, but okay. Matt Foreman is effective, uh, you know. Yeah, he struggles with high blood sugar. He's not overweight, but he's mm -hmm. but and so you know I'm I'm terrified about putting him on you know him going into DKA and and yeah. uh, you know, everything with with the high blood sugar. So, is there any drugs that you would suggest for a type one diabetic who is not overweight? Well, I'm uh, this this is uh, out of my area of expertise. Okay. <laughs> I've, uh, you know, I've, uh, I, I really wouldn't want to get, uh, get, get into that. I think this, this is really a, a medical, you know, probably an endocrinologist or a diabetes specialist. Do you think metformin about. might, m might help just I, I, like I, with the mental illness part? Do you think that would be helpful without, without med psychiatric medication? Possibly. I'm 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 frightened of giving an opinion in an area. Oh, okay. Where I'm, uh, okay. It's a difference be between an opinion and an expert opinion, uh -huh. and I, I I think you deserve a better opinion than I could give on this. Uh, okay. The the management of type one diabetes is not something that I'm comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you. Okay, any more questions for Dr. Martyr? Any more thoughts you have, or any thing you'd like to share? while we're all together. Um, can I, um, Dr. Marger, do you think I lost you or wherever he is? I lost him on my screen. Do you think clozapine might become an injectable if it's not yet? No? No, I don't. Uh, you know, it's for, for, for any number of reasons, but uh, it, it, it'll never be an injectable. It's, uh, you know, you know when, when someone gets clozapine, they get like, 300 milligrams. If you take the drugs where they uh, are injectable, there uh, it's 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 less. You 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 would it, it would just be just a huge amount of uh, drugs. So I I, I it, it'll never be injectable. Thank you. Whether I, I actually some of the, you know if these newer drugs as are as good as I hope. Uh, they are working on uh, new formulations for these drugs. You know, you know, if they, you know, you know, once they get approvals, it, I understand it's possible for both of them. Mm -hmm. So do we have any more thoughts or questions for Dr. Martyr while we have his expertise and his profound knowledge of the newer drugs and also the older drugs? I just want to, Add a Janice. comment, um, yes. Dr. Martyr. It's mm -hmm. Janice. Thank you for sharing everything tonight. Dr. Sajay has had been working with Joey for ten years. My son's twenty nine. Okay. Initially, he put him. He has paranoid schizophrenia, like textbook. I took my family to family class, and I learned about all the meds. And initially, Joey gained. He's six foot two, tall, thin. He gained sixty seven pounds on clozapine. And I was so upset. He was upset. So many side effects. Then I talked Dr. Sajay to get him off. It wasn't working. We tried everything. And then Joey got very sick for three years. He had um, capgrass, capgrass where he thought right. part of schizophrenia. He thinks you're an intruder. You're not really his family member. Yeah. He thought I wasn't his mom for three years. My eyes were too green. I'm not whatever. And when I learned from the meds, they dim the voices, but they don't get rid of them. So I put Joey and Dick was working with him as his conservator for many years. We put him in Earth House, New Jersey. And they said the only way they would let him in, he was very sick for a long time, was if I put him back on clozapine. And I was so against it. But guess what? We put him back on clozapine. They had a special diet. No red meat, no dairy, no sugar, limited coffee, yeah. exercise. And you said something tonight. Dr. Martyr, that the person on the meds has to be motivated. And mm -hmm. I have to tell you, the older they get, I find that they mellow out. The clozapine is working phenomenally. And I have my son pretty much 89% back. And 
I just want to say clozapine is, in my opinion, the Rolls Royce med for my son. And you really have to watch it because it makes him feel not satiated, not full. So, and I have to slow Joey down when we go out to eat. Like, you can't just eat it in one bite. You have to slow down. And he himself is so motivated, doctor. He eats half of what he brings it back to his roommates. And they, of course he can't work. He's tried for times. Mm. It's a hard life to have mental illness, but I have to say clozapine is the Rolls Royce for my son. And if you can talk your family member into doing it, it works better than the injections. Because as you said, Dr. Martyr, it's a little more concentrated. I think he's on 450 right now, yeah. milligrams. But it was five for a while. And there were many more side effects that were not great. You know, But right now, I'm just, I'm happy for the first time in many years. So clozapine is because of it. Yeah, thank you, thank, thank yes. you for that story. And, and, mm -hmm. and I also think sometimes in the course of a, of a person's life who has schizophrenia, they, uh, they first deny the illness and they fight everyone and then they take ownership of it. You know, it's my illness and I'm going to that. And, and then the illness doesn't uh, define them anymore. Yeah, so true. Wonderful. So yes, Cynthia, yeah. question. Yes, Cynthia? You're oh, muted. Hi, Cynthia, Cynthia. You're, you're I muted. Know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Um, it's so nice to see everyone here and Dr. Martyr, as usual. You're just so fabulous. You're so wonderful. Thank you for sharing with all of us here at NAMI. I just want to say that my son was so, so sick, so sick, and he's coming around every single day more and more now. You have like patience and patience and more patience. He's working mm -hmm. out of the house. He's going to a clinic and working. And um, Clazarel is his life. And he's gone down from 550 and he's on 300 now. Mm -hmm. And he's a new person. He's really, he, it just takes so much time and patience to get our kids there. And as long as you have good doctors, and I feel I'm so blessed to have Dr. Martyr and the UCLA Psycho Clinic. It was really hard being on social services and going to Dee Dee Hirsch. I have to be yeah. honest with all of you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank, Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martyr. And not me. Oh, you're welcome. It's it's a privilege to work with your family. Thank with you. Your, with you and your son. So any last thoughts or questions here for this very knowledgeable Dr. Martyr that we were fortunate to get to come? This is May is Mental Health Month. So mm. this is a great introduction to the knowledge, to your knowledge level from Dr. Martyr to start, the, start this month. So, I have a question. Yes. yes. Uh, my name's Dana. My son uh, has schizoaffective, and he's with social services with the Orange County Mental Health Department. Uh, I didn't know that the shots actually level out, so that's very encouraging for me to hear. He's on a two-month shot that they said treats a <clears throat> I mean, bipolar and schizophrenia. I don't remember mm -hmm. what they called it. Mm -hmm. But I know it's not can't have risperidone because he's allergic to that. Mm -hmm. um, my question, I don't know if it's ridiculous or not, but all the information you're giving, is this common knowledge? Is this, are psychiatrists required to keep up with this? Or is this just you and your curiosity keeping up with what's going on? Because some of the things you discussed in the different drugs, I would so love for him to have an opportunity to try or get exposure to he's been living the worst of the worst example of this illness now for about three years and right now yeah. is just really horrifying so i i think there is a uh, a real problem for families trying to get uh, treatment for psychotic illness there are uh there aren't enough providers 
and there aren't enough providers who are familiar with all of, with, with the complexity of, of, of treating this illness. And, and I didn't mention, you know, the usefulness of uh, psychotherapies, which are an essential component. Uh, and that, uh, you know, many psychiatrists don't understand that uh, the best treatment is usually, uh, you know, includes both a medication and some kind of psychosocial uh, treatment or rehabilitation or cognitive behavior therapy. But I, 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 I feel very badly that uh, families don't know, you know, that there are, there are many good psychiatrists, but I don't think a family member has any way of knowing whether they're getting the right treatment, the highest quality treatment. And, and I, I don't know how to fix that. I, uh, I, I've, I've, I was telling uh, Sharon and Erin earlier on, I had this image of uh, writing a book on, on a consumer's guide to getting the right treatment. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, when do you know whether your psychiatrist knows whether he or she is, you know, you know it, when do you know whether or not your psychiatrist is really competent to, to treat a complex illness, you know. Some patients, you know, are, are very straightforward and uh, easy. Uh, you know, I guess an orthopedic surgeon could treat them. Uh, but uh, the people I see are all complicated. You know, they have medical problems, they have social challenges and, and other things. And I, I, I wish there was a way that family members and, and patients themselves could tell whether they're getting the right kind of provider. I haven't answered your question just in kind of a peripheral way that I've, I'm very sympathetic to uh, having your son treated and not knowing whether he's getting the kind of quality of care that he should be entitled to. Well, I personally don't think he ever is getting enough of anything, so. Yeah, yeah, but. <laughs> you know, like on that level, but. Um, he has severe short-term memory loss, and the, tonight's the first time I heard that's common. Yeah, very actually, common. Yeah. Uh, I know cognitively he <sighs> is very much lower than his norm. But the this is we had thought he'd literally had a stroke or something, and and but it's sounding now from what you're saying, it could possibly be the medications or and or, hmm? you know. His illness. It's more likely the, it's, it's more likely the illness. I, I mean, not all, but many people with uh, schizophrenia have uh, cognitive impairments, trouble with short-term memory, long-term memory, attention, and and, and it uh, you know there are ways to get around it sometimes, but it uh, it just makes their lives more challenging. Okay. And we have to admire them, you know, when when they're able to succeed. And I think we have to admire every patient that stays on this earth and no. takes medications and and owns their illness as much as they can. I mean, they're the heroes and heroines of our American culture right. because I, America just doesn't provide very much for the mentally ill. They just leave them disfranchised and homeless in the streets and let them die that way. America is not a nation that takes care of its mentally ill people very much at all. Yeah. And, and, and you're right, there's not enough providers, there's not enough hospitals, there's not enough psych beds in LA County. They've reduced the number of psych beds in LA County about 3,000 or 4,000. There's just not enough of anything for your relatives, unfortunately, in this, in this nation. Yeah. And if you want to dispute that, Dr. Martyr, please do. Okay. No, I, I, I agree. That's a, a huge problem. Yeah. Can I dare? I feel like I'm, I don't want to monopolize. Can I ask a quick question, Dr. Martyr? Do sure. Time? Yes. Last question here. Yes. If you could give me advice on, um, it's very interesting when you say the patient's because I think my son, one reason he fell apart is a girl said he was fat and he stopped his meds, ended up in jail, a real debacle. So um, one of the things I find really interesting when you said the patient has to want to lose weight, the doctor, I told him about this and he's going to, I think he's working on the Olympic or whatever that thing's called that you mentioned. But as a parent, like if I see my son, when I saw him, he wanted to go to in and out and he just like, there was no bottom, you know, the fries. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I guess I'm wondering, like, if I'm visiting and I'm trying to take a little bit of a back seat, do I just get him whatever he wants, you know, the extra large Neapolitan shake? Or would, I don't know if you can advise on that. Or is there a way to go, you know, let's see if we can. I mean, we're, we're good, but, I'm, you know, I just I don't know if you could give any advice on what a parent should do when you're visiting him, you know, when he's in treatment. And do you say something? Uh, let him eat? What do you what do you do? <laughs> well, I, 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 I suspect that uh, as as a mother working with uh, a son with the illness, that, that you're more of an expert than I am. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I just, uh, uh, I, I really feel for that dilemma of, uh, you know, you want your son to, you know, that there, there, there are programs, you know, getting yourself out of it and get, you know, things like Weight Watchers and other things where, you know, it becomes kind of peers who are, uh, getting him you know, who are trying to motivate one another to lose weight and, and you know, uh, that that might get you off the hook a bit. Uh, but I could also, you know, uh, I also understand what a terrible responsibility it is when he just wants, you know, you, well, don't, you want foot. him to be happy, yeah. Yeah, he just broke his foot. So now he's like laying there, he can't exercise. And I don't want to indulge that feeling of, you know, but he was a football player. He goes, I'm back to my football weight. And I, and I just want to accept, I'm just loving him. That's what I'm doing. I'm just loving him. But I, I, I appreciate yeah. giving it back to the mother because I think I'll find a way because he knows I don't like to eat in and out. So I'm going to say, let's go here for the both of us. Yeah. I, mean, I, I just, just remember Dr. Lieberman brought a family member, a mother and a son to one of his talks for us. Mm -hmm. And the son was so overweight. And the son wanted to move back home with the mother and live with the mother. And she wouldn't let him until he lost weight. And so this boy started walking two blocks, which is all he could do. He was obese. Then, he's, then he walked four blocks. Then he got up to 10 blocks and he lived somewhere in Westwood. And then he got up to where he could walk down to Gold's Gym in Venice. And he would work out at the gym and then he would walk all the way back. And he lost 150 pounds and he was looking wonderful. So the mother let him move in because he was so motivated to lose weight. He did all of this intense walking from Westwood down to Venice and worked out at Gold's Gym and would walk back. Yeah. And he was very handsome and he was living at home with his mom. And, and so the mom put some demands on him and it worked because it was a partnership. She gave him what he wanted and he gave her what she wanted mm -hmm. that was a working partnership about losing weight so i just leave you with that colette if that gives you any thoughts or yeah. thank you, know, you. <laughs> yes. and we want to thank dr Mark for this incredible talk and this uh, filling up with all this new knowledge about the new meds and for his expertise and him answering all of your questions, it's it's an honor to have you at our speaker series for this month. So let's give him a nice round of applause. And we Thank so you. appreciate you. Everybody who was here appreciated you very much, Dr. Martyr. And, and we'll talk again. Sure, of course. And thank, thanks for inviting me into your community, which is wonderful. And we'll invite you again. You know, you're of not course. escaping. You're not escaping. Okay. We'll invite you next year for sure. Okay. So thank you all for attending tonight. You also are heroes, the mothers and fathers and, and siblings that, that care. Because when mental illness invades a family, it's as if someone threw a hand grenade into that family. It creates mm -hmm. chaos, devastation, a sense of loss, uh, grief anger you know it's so you all deserve a great hand too for supporting your relative and loving your relative and trying to create a healing environment within your family for your relatives so let's i give all of you a round of applause every mother i'm looking at and there's a couple of fathers here i give you all a round of applause for your commitment to helping your ill relative so peace be with you Peace be with you, and we'll, we'll see you in, in our next meeting will be 
the uh, first Wednesday in June for our next speaker meeting. Erin, do we have someone scheduled for that yet? Uh, I believe we do. Um, Elizabeth is working on that because it's LGBTQ plus month and it's pride month. So I believe that we'll have an LGBTQ plus uh, speaker for the month of June. So okay. we're working on that now. Um, okay. And then perhaps um, we might see some of you at our gala coming up on May 12th. Um, you might have received something in the mail and our newsletters that have been going out via email. So it will be an evening of celebration to celebrate our community and all that we do. So I hope that you will join us. Um, there's some links yes. in the chat. Yes. Also, there's a survey there too. If you are a new member or a returning member of our programs, please take a moment to fill those out. It's for the Department of Mental Health. It really helps us provide funding for all our programs. And also a special thanks to Janice Black Warner, who really is, you know, such an angel for us for so many years on our advisory council and really makes these speaker series possible. So thank you, Janice, for, well, for being you. here this Come evening. On. And always, you know, just providing so much for our organization. So thank you. Yes. Well, I'd like thank to just, you. if I could, I would just like to piggyback that by saying it was really hard to hear from some of the um, questions tonight about people who don't feel that they have all the access that they need to the mental health care that their family members need. And it's, it's really a special thing that this speaker series is here because most people would not have access to Dr. Martyr um, to go to his office and to go to his clinic at UCLA. But to have this speaker series available to be able to hear from people like that and get some of these very complicated questions answered. So kudos, Janice, to you for your continued speaker series and getting this message out to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to this very high level of um, information and feedback about their loved ones. Good work. Thank you. Thank you, Dick, for that. Thank you. So I, I guess we'll say good night for tonight, and we look forward to seeing you in June, and we would love to have you come to our May 12th gala. It's going to be at the top of the design center uh, on the top floor. It's you got to kind of get dressed up to come, and we are honoring Lynetta Walgren, who brought Lowell Milken to us, and Lowell Milken has been funding NAMI Westside LA in a very extensive way, and we're so grateful to him and to Lynetta for arranging a meeting with NAMI Westside LA and Lowell Milken. So Lynetta Walgren will be honored. Pure Edge that did our whole photogra photographic series will be honored. And who else that night, Janice? Twitch. I mean, who else, Aaron? Twitch. Who else? The memory of Ellen DeGeneres' Twitch. DJ, Twitch, on, uh, I believe it was December 14th. He um, he killed himself. And I was a huge fan of his as, and the Boss family during the pandemic. On Instagram, they had dance classes. And he was Ellen DeGeneres' DJ, probably the most inspirational man. And... Thank goodness, Alice and his wife, after four or five months, is coming out with the kids, and they're letting us, as NAMI Westside LA, honor the memory of her husband. And today, she she was on the Today Show talking about her relationship with NAMI Westside LA, and Aaron did something with Marvista, Aaron, the school. Thank you, Janice. You, you said that Aaron. really lovely. So yes, we're we're. We're honoring the legacy of Twitch, and we're actually starting a new program with Allison um, called Hearts and Minds. She started a foundation called Move with Kindness, and the Hearts and Minds program is really empowering, encouraging people to take care of their physical health, and it, that will in turn take care of your mental health. So very much underlining a lot of the topics that we were discussing tonight too, um, just physically getting your body moving, things like that, nutrition, making sure you take care of yourself physically because it does so much improve your mental health as well. So we did an event with the Mar Vista Boys and Girls Club and we did a lot of movement. Cynthia and Garrett were there um, and doing the resource table, which was wonderful. And it was really um, helping out the kids and and the parents there so it, it was a great event 
And we all appreciate you so much, Erin, as our executive director. You are a wonderful face for NAMI Westside LA and you're articulate and you have become a excellent speaker on our behalf. And we're very grateful for all the work you do for us. You do a lot. You do, you're working, you know, probably 50, 60 hour work weeks yeah. during the week. Also, our Beverly Hills Police Chief, Mark Stainbrook, is coming, and we're going to bring Nami, the new mental health dog for the Beverly Hills Police, will be showing up at our gala. So we have a lot of excitement and lots of people to honor. And thank you, Aaron and Sharon and Dr. Martyr, for what a lovely evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you again, Janice. So goodbye, everybody. We'll see you the 1st of June in we hope to see you on our gala on May the 12th. Good night, everyone. Be well and thank Good you. Night. Good night. Good night. I'm going to I'm going to